Well, good morning. We're going to turn today to Proverbs 14 and to verse 22. Proverbs 14 and verse 22, which says, Do not those who plot evil go astray, but those who plan what is good find love and faithfulness. So it's Proverbs 14, verse 22. Do not those who plot evil go astray, but those who plan what is good find love and faithfulness. Now, the key words, I think, the way into this proverb are the words plot and plan. It's about people who are devising. That's the, that's the word. It's the same word each time, the word plot and the word plan, actually the same word being translated two different ways. And uh, elsewhere in the Bible, the word is translated plow. And I think that gives us some insight into what this proverb is about. I don't mean it's about farming. Uh, but when you plow, uh, that is a, a serious job. It's a, a hard job, but it's a future-focused job. Uh, so someone who's plowing is not plowing just for the sake of plowing. Uh, they are plowing because they're planning to plant and because they want that, uh, that seed to grow and because they want that uh, seed to turn into a harvest so they can feed their families, so that they can make money and uh, feed other people. So the connection here, the, the point here, is not somebody sort of daydreaming, just idly thinking and wishing and desiring. No, this is more of a life plan. This is more of a big picture thing. And so this is a proverb that's talking about the big plans we have for our lives uh, or for a part of our lives or for a time in our lives. It's about our devising, where we're making plans and thinking something through with an eye to the future, with a goal in mind. Uh, so that's the idea, plotting, planning, devising, uh, giving careful thought uh, with both eyes on the future. That's the idea. Now, uh, let's talk about that a little bit. First of all, let's point out that that's everywhere. You know, Proverbs was written by a king, and uh, you often get a sense that he's trying to equip other king types uh, to reign and to rule. Uh, and of course, if you're a king, then you do a lot of plotting, a lot of planning, a lot of devising. That's your big job. You're supposed to have the big picture. You're supposed to know where you are going. But I think it's important to point out that it's not just kings that function like that. You, to be human is to be planning. Uh, to be a human being is to have a scheme. It's to be thinking about the future. It's to be, it's to be wondering where you're going. It's to be uh, thinking about what your life is about and the direction and the purpose of it. Uh, and that's a really good thing. You know, it's part of who and what we are as human beings. It's, it's part of the image of God in us. Yeah, it's a God-like quality. God is the God who plans, and, and animals don't plan. Uh, they live, but they live by instinct. But human beings, we've got instincts too. And uh, when we just let them take control, uh, things usually go quite badly wrong. We are designed to think. We're designed to have plans and purposes and ideas. So this proverb is talking about that. It's talking about our plans, our purposes, and we all have them. Now, the second thing this proverb is talking about, so this is chapter 14, verse 22. The second thing it's talking about is that what we plan matters. So... There are two possibilities being presented to us here. Uh, it talks about those who plot evil. And it says about them that they will go astray. So there's one way to plan. As we're thinking, as we're anticipating the future, we are uh, planning evil. We're going to exploit. Uh, we are going to 
take over, we're going to destroy, we're going to get what we want. So that's one type of planning. And I don't know how you feel about that, but there's a fair chance that you think, well, I'm pretty safe there. You know, that sounds like you're describing some kind of maniac, you know, a, a sort of Bond villain type who's seeking to take over the world. You know, I make my plans, but they're quite ordinary. You know, I'm not trying to take over the world. I'm not trying to uh, destroy anyone. I'm, uh, you yeah, know, I'm not a Bond villain. Um, but I want to point out that though we use the word evil to describe something sort of major and big, uh, the Bond villain type, the Bible uses the word evil in a much more subtle way, or rather it tells us that evil is much more subtle than the Bond villain model might suggest. And the Bible says that evil is actually something which is really, really bad. Uh, and it's something which lies in every human heart. And it's there and it's often undetected and it's often masquerading as something good. And one of the ways we see this evil, one of the big ways we see this evil in our own day is in the relentless self-focus that we are taught and that we don't need to be taught. We already have it. It's our instinct. Uh, it's true, isn't it? Every human being, we're looking after number one. Of course we are. Nobody else is going to. We have a relentless self-focus. Now we say there's nothing wrong with that. Well, uh, the Bible says there is. The Bible says that that kind of self-focus that we find so instinctive is, is actually outrageous because we are not the center of the universe. We are not the center of all things. Uh, the world is not designed to revolve around us, to orbit us. And to think that it is, is a profound sickness. And to imagine that we could get everything organized as we like is, is a profound problem. It's evil. And, and you can use such a strong word because Actually, what we're doing there is trying to replace God himself. You see, we're not supposed to be the hub of the wheel. We're not supposed to be the center of everything, but God is. And so our sort of instinct, which we feel is very reasonable, our instinct to be the center, this self-focus that we have, is actually a, an attempt to replace God himself, at least in our little sphere at least in the context of our own lives and our own thinking and our own future and our own choices and our own behavior. So the Bible doesn't let us off the hook here. It uses a sort of big word like evil and we think, well, that's got nothing to do with me. That's about Hitler or Stalin or somebody else. But the Bible won't let us off the hook so easily. It, it goes spiritual on us and it goes Godward on us. And it says to us, Oh, well, think again. Uh, and even our relentless self-focus, well, that's at the heart of all evil. You know, everything else after that is just a matter of degree. So, um, we've got our relentless self-focus and, you know, that has uh, an evil dimension to it, an evil essence to it. Now, what this proverb is telling us is that if we make plans like that, if we make choices like that, there will be inevitable consequences. And underlying this proverb is, is the fact that God will give us what we want. There's like an, a, a sort of moral inevitability about life. If you choose to live in an evil way, then inevitably, trouble is going to come. Now, not mathematically, but genuinely. And of course, in the end, it is mathematical on the day of judgment. Um, but the, the point is, if you plot evil, um, if you are relentlessly self-focused in the way you live your life, inevitably, you're going to find your, your life goes awry, that you go astray. That's the way it's put in verse 22. Do not those who plot evil go astray. And you see the way it's put there. It's put as if it's a self-evident thing. 
Now, this is what the proverb is saying. Uh, what we plan, what's going on in our hearts, the way we think about the future, it matters. And if it is relentlessly self-focused, then be absolutely sure that uh, our plans will not come to fruition, that we will go astray, that we will suffer loss, that we're going to get lost in the labyrinth of life. Now, um, let's go to a third thing. Um, we've talked about this planning and scheming. It's everywhere. It's part of what it means to be a human being. Secondly, we've said that what we plan matters, uh, that we've got an instinct to plan what is evil and self-focused. And the warning here is that God will let you go that way. If you insist on it, uh, he will give you what you want and you will find yourself getting lost. You will go astray. So let's go to the last thing to talk about, um, because there's another side to the coin. Uh, what does it mean then to plan what is good? Now, that's the other possibility that's held out here. You know, do not those who plan evil go astray? Well, you don't want to do that, obviously. But those who plan what is good find love and faithfulness. Those who plan what is good. There's an inevitable outcome of that as well. There's God giving us what we want. If what we're planning is good, then he will give us what is good, uh, what is ultimately good, not in a mathematical sense, but in an ultimate sense, in a real sense. Now, the great question then becomes, what does it mean to plan what is good? You know, if that's going to bring me safely through life and then on into eternity, uh, what does it mean to plan what is good? Well, just uh, two things to point out that help us answer that question. Uh, first thing is we need to realize that God has a plan. It was conceived before the world was made. The creation of the world is part of the plan. Uh, it's a plan uh, made by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Uh, the whole triune Godhead working together uh, to conceive and then unfold and complete a great eternal plan. Now that's Christianity 101. God is God. God is sovereign. God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And God works to a great plan uh, that is perfect. It is precision engineered. And, and it's wonderful. So it's a plan to create, a plan to allow the fall, and then a plan to rebuild, uh, and a plan to defend. And the Bible's word for it is a plan to redeem, uh, to buy back a broken world and to restore that broken world, not just bringing it back to what it was, but making it everything it could ever be. Now that plan uh, is... Uh, what the Bible is revealing. And the unfolding of that plan is what the Bible is uh, revealing. It's the story the Bible tells. And we, of course, are still in that unfolding story. Uh, this plan is the story of whole of human history. And at the center of the plan is God made flesh, God coming down, God entering his creation, taking into union with himself in the person of his son, a full and real human nature. We call it the incarnation, achieved through the virgin birth uh, by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's uh, just the most amazing event that God, who is infinite and eternal, God the Son, would come and confine and restrict himself to a real human nature to a place and a time it's amazing now why is he doing that and you see how his life unfolds it doesn't go well it ends up in disaster he's rejected and condemned and crucified now why is that there what what's the what's the big idea well this is the punchline of the bible that is how god redeems uh, he sends his son into the world to take our sin, uh, to take our self and all the judgment that that brings, our self-focus, uh, to take all of that sin and to pay for it in his own person. 
So that's what's going on. That's why Jesus comes. That's why he submits to die on a cross. It's because he's atoning for our sins. It's a massive, massive moment. And uh, that's God's plan. It's to rebuild, it's to redeem through Christ. Jesus rose from the dead the second, uh, the third day, second day, the third day. And um, uh, there in his resurrection body, we see the beginning of the new creation of what redemption is going to bring one day across the whole of the universe. Uh, and, and so in Christ now, the invitation goes out to, to turn and to believe, to become part of this new creation, uh, to join the church, which is the beginnings, a little colony of what will one day be, and to experience then, right there and then, new birth, the forgiveness of sins, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, who will empower us and equip us and move us that we might live. Uh, that's the plan. So, you know, here am I with my little plans. It's all about me and, and how my life's got to go and what I'm going to do in the next few years. So here am I with my little plans. But what I've got to see is that God has a plan and it's all embracing. It encompasses me and my life. It encompasses my family. It encompasses my community, my city, my nation. It encompasses the whole of human history. And it's a good plan. It's a plan to bring life where there's death. It's a plan to give forgiveness where there's guilt. It's a plan to give hope where there's none. Uh, it's a plan that will end uh, in the glorious renewal of all things forever and ever and ever. That's God's plan. Now, question is, uh, how could I plan what is good? You know, what is good will mean I experience faithfulness and love. That's what the proverb is telling me. So how do I plan what is good? Well, surely it's obvious. Planning what is good means joining God in pursuing his plan. You know, that's what our plans for life should be. Not about what I'm going to do here, what I'm going to do there, what I'm going to get over there. No, our plans should be uh, knowing what God is planning and embracing that. So how do I plan what is good? Well, you've got to become a believer, first of all. You've got to come to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. Uh, and then having become a believer and really as part of the same act, you've got to become a disciple. You've got to become a follower of Jesus. Uh, Di Hanke preached about that here last night. Uh, we've got to become a follower of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus. You know, those are the sort of plans that should be absorbing our God-given uh, faculty for planning. Those are the sort of thoughts who should be working. How do I join God in his mission? How do I play a part in this great plan of redemption? How do I be like Jesus, fulfilling the Father's will? That's uh, what our energy should be going on. That's what we should be searching for and questioning. And the promise here in this proverb is that when you join God in his plan, you find that certain things begin to meet you. Certain things become begin to accompany you. You'll find something. Uh, and what we're told here is that we will find love. You know, God is a God of love. This plan is a God of love. You join him in his plan. You put your faith in Christ. You start to become a disciple. You, you start to give your faculties and your time and your energy to pursuing the, the plan of redemption that God has. And you will find a deep and profound experience of love. And it will get deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, you'll be grounded and rooted in love. Uh, you'll begin to comprehend that this love is beyond comprehension, that it's long and deep and high and wide, and, and, and it envelops you and begins to define you. It becomes your identity. It's a big thing. Uh, and you'll be filled with all the fullness of God as you join him. So it's love uh, you discover. You might not discover riches, you might not discover fame, you might not discover success, but frankly, you can keep that. If I'm discovering love, a love like that, that's what I'm really thirsting for. You know, all the people that search riches, search for riches, it's love that they're after. They think the money can help them buy it. 
and all the people that are looking for fame, it's love they're after. They think that will get them love, and it won't. But you become a believer, you become a disciple, then love is what you find. And not just love, but covenant love. Uh, covenant love, it's translated here as faithfulness or truth. Uh, a love that is not an emotional thing. It's not a, a rush. Uh, well, sometimes it, you get that, but it's not its essence. This love is an utter commitment from Almighty God to do you good. It's a commitment to forgive your sins. It's a commitment to give you his Holy Spirit. It's a commitment to renew in you the image of God that has been defaced by our sin. It's a commitment to make you new. It's a commitment to redeem you. It's a commitment to make you like Jesus. I got to stop, haven't I? But, um, you know, my mind went to Psalm 23, the very end of Psalm 23. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You see, if you join God in his plans, then you find that you are walking in the way of God's grace. And uh, you find that you have got good company. And in pursuit of you now is goodness and love. And th those things will never leave you until you arrive safe at home where you will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, this is Christianity. This is the gospel. This is wonderful. And it's available to us in Christ. Okay, let's pray together, shall we? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you to help us as we engage with these amazing Proverbs, the way they unfold, and get beneath the surface of our lives and open up our hearts. Lord, please help us if we're still resisting the idea that we devise what is evil when we focus on ourselves. Lord, we pray you deliver us from that. Help us uh, to know ourselves a little better and help us to know the way the world works a little better. Uh, open your word to us. Give us your spirit. Convince the unconvinced, we pray. But Lord, for those of us who are convinced, help us now to make your plans our plans, uh, not to have... Uh, just a little part of our life that's about you and what you do, but that the whole of our lives, so we might join you in this great work that you are doing, on this great mission that you are engaged in to make all things new. And thank you, Lord, that that's so big, so comprehensive, that there's no aspect of our lives that can't be embraced, that can't be shaped by your great plan of redemption whether it's our family life, our internal thought life, our relationships, our leisure time, our church work, our worship, our uh, employment, uh, our citizenship, whatever it may be. So, Lord, we give ourselves to you afresh. Help us, strengthen us, keep us, enable us. We ask these things, and we ask them in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, I'll be back with another one of these this time tomorrow. I'll see you then. Have a great day. Thanks a lot.